Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we open the study and open the word of God and that of his prophet, shall we ask for his blessing and for his guidance and seek to understand more clearly that which is being presented before us for the times in which we are currently living. Shall we now seek him in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, these are awesome times. Times where we can see that we greatly need your wisdom and your grace. We thank you for these opportunities that we have to be able to open your word freely with others and come together to worship you, to seek to understand that which you have provided. Our minds, Father, have been clouded by many thousands of years of sin. And by choices that we have made that have not always been in our best interest, for they have not always brought us closer to you. Direct us now, guide us as we assemble together. I thank you for each brother and sister that are here for this meeting and for those that will view this later. Help us now to look to understand that which you would have us to see. May your will be done. May our minds be open to receive the words that you would have us to understand. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to have a little bit of a review from last week. Just shortly. Now, In this situation, we have been studying what? What did we study this last week? Are you talking about last Sabbath morning? Yes, I do. I am. Yeah. So we are reading Ellen White's uh, articles that were basically counsels um, to people at that time, the parallel counsel that would apply to us at this time. Okay. And how we consider others, how we judge others, how we talk about others. And the, the overall subject that she or had been chosen for these articles when they were published was the need for brotherly love. Now we can see this need was great in the time of Gideon, the time of the judges. We can see that this was necessary in the formational time of the first church, the church of the apostles. And it has been most necessary in the time now with the movement. So we're going to go back over a couple of paragraphs before we go into the new material. We are to watch for souls as those that must give an account. Instead of criticizing, pray for deliverance from this evil habit. For while our time is occupied with this kind of doing, souls for whom Christ died are perishing whom we might save. We are not to be critical people. We are not to be criticizing others. Many are starving for the bread of life, and there is no time for accusing the brethren. Rather, pray one for another 
that ye may be healed and may go forth to seek and to save the lost and the wandering sheep. Find the erring, discouraged ones by careful, diligent search and bring them back to the fold. Christ has said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love to one another. John 13.35 What symbol do we see here? Well, we see the 1335 from Daniel chapter 12. The 1335 from Daniel chapter 12. And why is that important? Well, if you look at how the Millerites understood this prophecy, you know, as blessed is he that cometh and waiteth to the 1335. But they saw this as the kingdom of God was at hand. Right. And so that's how they equated it, that... Uh, that's what it was referring to. Um, so it should become a time when we have love for one another if we're in God's kingdom. Now, as you correctly stated, the prophecy from Daniel 12, blessed is he that cometh to the 1335. Can we then also apply that blessed is he that have love one to another. Mm -hmm. Are we not living in exactly that same time? And are we not, not able to see chiastically how similar we are to exactly what the Millerites are saying was the time of Christ's return to this earth? If we have no love one for another, if we are choosing to criticize and to cast out brothers and sisters, then we are not worthy of the blessing of those that come unto the 1335. Now, I know that this is preaching to the choir at this point. The problem and the point that we must see is that there are those that are choosing yet to criticize. Whether they hear this or whether they do not, they are wandering. Here we have this very directly. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And the 1335 is being tied with it. So if we are more willing to criticize, if we are more willing to cast out, if we are not willing to be assembled in unity, then we are not Christ's disciples. Now, Heidi and I were reading, because uh, we're reading nine testimonies now, um, and we are reading from that this morning, and I think it's this section here. Mm. Let's see if I can find this. Um, yeah. It's not the best way to do this. I need to go here. Oh, there we go. Um, he says in, in this section, it's a section called Call to Be Witnesses. It's the section after the last crisis. And um, she says here, it is not only by preaching the truth, not only by distributing literature, that we are to witness for God. Let us remember that the Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity, and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldly. Not all the books written can serve the purpose of a holy life. Men will believe not only not what the preacher pre minister preaches, but what the church lives. 
Too often the influence of the sermon preached from the pulpit, pulpit is counteracted by the sermon preached in the lives of those who claim to be advocates of truth. Amen. That's nine testimonies, page 21, paragraph one. 211. Interesting. Does that not go along with exactly what she says next? Strive to have a real connection with Christ and become laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Work with self hidden in Jesus. And the Lord will add to the church such as shall be saved. The great master shepherd will give wisdom to the under shepherds that they may become living working agents for his use. Let them not seek to exalt themselves, but to lift up Jesus. Then they may go in and out and find pasture. They will then be partakers of the riches of the grace of Christ, which passes knowledge. If we do not have a real connection with Christ, if we are not letting self become secondary, letting self go and being hidden with Christ. Then we are not showing that we are his disciples. If we're not willing to show that we are his disciples, then whose disciple are we? God cannot commit his sheep and lambs to the care of a church who make it manifest that they have no aptitude or wisdom to care for the flock of his pasture. But this state of inefficiency need not continue, for we may have high thoughts of God's mercy and infinite love. Sinful and worthless creatures though we are, through a vital connection with Christ, we, are, we yet may be renewed in knowledge and true holiness, and thus reflect the glory and the image of our Creator and Redeemer, and be qualified to care for His sheep and lambs. Not only have the sheep and lambs been dealt with in hardness, but even the shepherds themselves have been treated with reckless disregard. They have been spoken of in a way that shows that many in high and lower positions have little courtesy to give to God's ordained ministers. There are those that are ordained of God, yet not ordained of man. There are those that see themselves as being the great leaders, yet they are not so ordained by God. The churches themselves have been educated in such a way that have had too little respect for those who preach the word of God and who for years have given full proof of their ministry. These are the ones that are preaching the clear word, the direct word, not the word of peace and safety. But this way of dealing with the ministers and with the members of the family of God must be changed. The blessing of God cannot rest upon those who manifest little respect for the workers together with him. This is a very specific comment. It is a comment that we need to let rest in its full import upon our minds. My brethren, I charge you to close your ears to fault finders, close your hearts 
that they may not be recipient of evil seeds of suspicion and distrust and open your hearts to the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. Whose words are we to ignore? Whose words are to be set aside? Fault-finders. Exactly. In the fold of Jesus Christ, the sheep and the lambs are to be gathered in one flock, to be nourished, to be defended from the attacks of wolves. Those who come newly into the faith are to be encouraged so that they shall have confidence in the ministers who walk worthily before the flock of God. They are to be fed with the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. We are waiting for the, son, the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. This faith distinguishes us from all other denominations. And as those who wait for the Lord, let us put on, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as christ forgave you so do ye and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful Colossians 3.12. Mrs. White finished her article on Brotherly Love Needed the following week on October 31st, 1893. Of those who had been led into error and who had become cold through backsliding and apostasy, Paul wrote, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused to you one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3. Again, he declares what had been the manner of his labor among the believers, saying, We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doeth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. Also, 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. May the Lord speak to the hearts of all who shall read these words. Who is this directed to? All that would read those words. So this is to us today, is it not? Correct. We should continually talk and practice the gentleness that Paul presents in this figure of a nurse cherishing her children. This is the manifestation of the spirit of Christ. When we truly receive Jesus, there will be a transformation of character and principles among us as members of Christ's body. All bitterness and wrath and malice and evil speaking will be put away from us. And the love of Christ will fill and overflow the heart. 
Our love for others will then be deep, be pure, and be fervent. And there will be no betrayal of sacred trusts. From heart softened and subdued by the love of Christ, we shall exhort, we shall admonish, reprove, warn, and we shall comfort the saints of God. We shall all stand one harmonious body. And our earnest affection one for another will increase more and more. Thus Christ will be represented in the world through human instrumentalities, and the work of God will be rapidly advanced, for workers for him will be raised up in various parts of the world. This is not according to man's order. This is according to God's order. Our lack of appreciation for the instrumentalities which the Lord has already raised up to carry forward his work has retarded the progress of truth. Ministers and workers in the cause have been lightly esteemed, and many have been treated without consideration or sympathy. When the church has died itself, Jesus will take possession of them and will work through them his holy compassion and tender love. May the Lord help his people. May the Lord burn away the dross and the tin and consume the selfishness that exists in the hearts of many of his professed followers and place upon them his own image and superscription. Now remember, this is written and published October 31st, 1893. Where was Mrs. White at this time? She's in Australia. So this is post-1886. This is seven years after the bitterness that came in the 1886 General Conference session when she was in Europe. This is being written at a time when the General Conference sought to do away with her influence because they thought that they were better off without her words and that they wished not to hear anything further from Jones or Wagner or Mrs. White. She is attempting to be very kind. She is presenting for them the things that they need to know, but they are things that were being rejected regardless. We've had seasons for fasting and prayer, beseeching that the Lord would raise up laborers to go into his harvest field. And yet when laborers have been raised up and sent to different fields, Many of them have not been appreciated, even those who have given full proof of their devotion to and interest in the work. Is this not describing the messages of Jones and Wagner from 1888? Envious tongues have spoken against them. Evil surmisings have been cherished and tares have been sown by those who would not like to reap the bitter harvest that will result. Before we appoint another day for fasting and prayer that the Lord shall raise up laborers, let us see to it that we treat those who have already been sent with respect and love as God would have treated them. Today, brothers and sisters, we have many that would seek to address very basic tenets of what they see as being the Advent message. And that's wonderful. But it is not wonderful when they are 
then ignoring those that choose to bring the very meat of the word. We are not still babes. We are to be as little children growing up and eating and partaking of the meat of the word. If we are not willing to strain our every faculty, our every facility to understand many of the things that are being presented, how can we ever think that we would then be among the 144,000? Let us not treat them in such a distrustful manner that their prayers will ascend to God for deliverance from the evil surmising and evil reports of their brethren. As long as those who are doing a good work for the master are not appreciated, but accused, condemned, and oppressed by the false tongue, how can we consistently ask God to raise up more laborers? There needs to be a turning away from tail bearing and tail bearers and a drawing toward our brethren, a coming near, even heart to heart, that the grace of Christ may be manifested in a large measure through his people. The church should be bound together with the golden chain of love. Then it would be terrible as an army with banners. If we have not this binding, if we are not willing to speak well of our other brothers and sisters, how can we ever give the final message that we are supposed to give? Doesn't seem possible now, does it? No, it doesn't. So what is tail bearing? Speaking against someone when they don't understand what's going on or making conjectures about what somebody else is saying. If I was, if I was to come out and say about you today, my brother, that you are promoting time setting that you have chosen a date in the future by which something was going to occur. And that you are, you are doing this time setting, even though in scripture, we are not to do so. When you have not done that, is that not tail bearing? Now that's what I thought. I had that concept of tail bearing as, as uh, you know, adding to what you're seeing in scriptures or, or surmounting or surmising your own surmisings of what those things mean. That's what I got the tail bearing. Okay. So are we, are we basically agreed then in that definition of tail bearing? Yes. Evidently okay. so. In a similar manner, when there are those that choose to make comments because they do not look to understand chronology with prophecy. And yet they wish to cast out those that are able to explain it. This is another type of division that is to be avoided. How do we do that? How do we do it? Did I hear that? Yeah. <clears throat> In a situation such as this, I would say that what we need to be doing is forgiving those 
that are choosing to remain willfully ignorant. Yeah, that's about the size of it. When our hearts are all open to receive the teaching of Jesus, there will be love for the brethren, and men will see the rich blessing of God is upon his people. What does this statement mean to you? Forty days after Christ's ascension, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples, was dissension seen among them as they gave their message in Jerusalem? Well, they'd been in the upper room for 10 days. They had been in the upper room praying, confessing their sins, and coming together one to another, where the simple fishermen of Galilee could then be united with one as a zealot, where the zealot, hateful and distrustful of anything of the government and of the Romans, was seen to be a brother of a publican, of a tax collector. All were united with the same message. None were looking and seeking division or saying, your message is too hard. Each had a message to give where they could explain different aspects, but they had respect for the way in which the others presented this message. Here is where we have fallen down. Prayer and fasting that laborers may be sent into the harvest field will avail nothing. While the spirit of evil surmising and criticism exists in the hearts of those to whom laborers are to be sent. We are to be doers of the word of Christ. Then our fasts and prayers will be effectual in bringing upon the church the Holy Spirit. Let there be decided work done to answer the prayer of Christ, that his disciples should be one as he is one with the Father. He says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also that shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me, John 17, 20 to 23. If the truth we profess to believe does not change the heart and transform the character, it is of no value to us. How do you take that statement? How should we accept that? Sound just like a matter of fact. It's the way I see it. (laughs) 
If the same defects of character remain in us after we have a knowledge of the truth, if pride, self-esteem, self-sufficiency, evil thinking, evil surmising, evil speaking still continue, if we judge those with whom we come in contact, we are not becoming sanctified through the truth and will have no part with Christ in his kingdom. Justification, sanctification. If we are not willing to become sanctified through the truth, we will have no part with Christ in his kingdom. We will be judged and found wanting. The Lord will deal with us as we deal with others. Have we dealt unkindly, unjustly with the brethren, with the world? Then it is for us to make confession, to repent, and to be converted, that our sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What are those times of refreshing that are yet to come from the Lord? Is this not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain? Hello. Hello, Mark. Um, I say this. Uh, I did joined in I did join in the study you did talk about my my pain I don't quite you, understand um right uh, why do you understand this? I did join in this study today morning. You did talk about the He did point it on me, make me have a stress, can't keep my job can't uh, I I be so close losing my mind losing my own job I am this close let me go oh fire me my my head is in the Crowds, my I see that white, white, white crowd is sneak in. Um, I heard you saying stuff of the this study. I can't take this in. That it is real did happen in that past. My head and my thought is in that past. That past is screaming inside of me. That campaign I go through. You did talk about it now. Okay. I I did say this that did happen in past in this earth. It is real. 
did heaven is real, how it is so me that make me to be believe that and trust in that make me be serve him. Tell the whole wide world of good news. He he done. I don't know about my own my I don't know what my my purpose he did this to me. I don't know about I just said to my mom I, I am thinking that this way he is coming back second time. Uh, he is king or not a king. His, his kingdom it is real or not. I wish I wish I be there to see it. I take it in. I can't go try it. This pain made me crying, weeping like a baby, side, side, side on the sidewalk of four years ago. Is that pain is so, so, to steep. I, I can't a uh, good try it. I, I need the cat of uh, uh, Bill Graham did pray on my mom and dad. They can prayers for this past the Soviet it is real. Or put me in, put me in like a dream and show me it is real, did happen. Till I be born, this past is done till I am ready to be born. They is so terrible, real. I let you. I like you back to talk now. Okay. As it was being stated, then it is for us to make confession, to repent and to be converted, that our sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The cause of God is to hold the first place in our plans and our affections. Nothing else is to be greater than the cause of God. There is need of bearing a straight message concerning the indulgence of self, while the cause of God is in need of means. Some are so cold and backslidden that they do not realize that they are setting their affections on earthly treasure which is soon to be swept away forever. The love of the world is binding them about like a thick garment. And unless they change their course, they will not know how precious it is to practice the self-denial for Christ's sake. All our idols, our love of the world must be expelled from the heart. There are ministers and faithful friends who see the danger that surrounds these self-bound souls, who faithfully present to them the error of their course, but instead of taking admonitions in the spirit in which they are given, and profiting thereby, those reproved rise up against the ones who deal with them faithfully. 
Oh, that they might arouse from their spiritual lethargy and now acquaint themselves with God. The world is blinding their eyes from seeing him who is invisible. They are unable to discern the most precious things that are of eternal interest, but view the truth of God in so dim a light that it seems of little value to them. The merest atom concerning their temporal interests assumes magnified proportions, while the things concerning eternity have dropped out of their reckoning. Our Lord insists upon the necessity of removing earthly idols. He would have us set free from delusions and snares and not mistake phantoms for realities. The Lord is coming. That is a statement. That is a fact. That is not a pipe dream. Time is short. Maybe not in our minds, but it is definitely short in God's manner. Get ready, get ready, get ready. For Christ's sake, call a halt. You have not a moment to lose. Put an end to all unjust, unrighteous criticism and humble your hearts before God. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Do not merely assent to the truth and fail to be a doer of the words of Christ. The truth must be applied to self. It must bring men and women who receive it to the rock, that they may fall upon the rock and be broken. Then Jesus can mold and fashion their characters after his own divine character. If we would listen to his voice, we must let silence reign in the heart. How many of us are willing to allow that? The clamors of self, the pretensions, its lusts, must be rebuked. And we must put on the robe of humility and take our place as humble learners in the school of Christ. When this is the attitude of our brethren, there will be no more a desire to climb up onto the judgment seat to judge others. But they will lie low at the foot of the cross. As they behold the matchless loveliness of the character of Christ, their own defects will be made plain, and the delusion of self-righteousness will in which encased the soul will be slept will be swept away, and the arrows of the Lord will find the heart. The truth must be applied to the souls of our people as never before or many who now feel at ease, will be weighed in the balances and found wanting. Meany, meany, tekel, you farson. As we have been observing, we have seen many that have been within this movement that are now choosing that the message that the movement is to give is false. They wish to set aside anything to deal with chronology, especially chronology combined with prophecy. Is this according to God's order? Now, on the 16th of December of 1890, Mrs. White wrote, The Duty of Confession. 
Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16. <coughs> what is the blessing that comes from confession and prayer one for another? Is it not that we are healed? Is it not that we are made whole? Is it not that we can then stand as men and women according to the very promise of Christ himself? If these words of inspiration were obeyed, they would lead to such results as are set forth by the Apostle Peter. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter 1, 22. All are fallible. All make mistakes and fall into sin. But if the wrongdoer is, is willing to see his errors, as they have been made plain by the conducting spirit of God, the convicting spirit of God, excuse me, and in the humility of heart will confess them to God and to the brethren, then he may be restored. Then the wound that sin has made will be healed. If this course were pursued, there would be in the church much more childlike simplicity and brotherly love heart beating in unison with heart. Is this not what we saw occur after the upper room experience? Is this not the presentation that was given forth on the day of Pentecost? The ministers of the word and others who fill responsible positions, as well as the body of the church, need this spirit of humility and contrition. The Apostle Peter writes to those who labor in the gospel, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, <clears throat> neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, 2-7. The prophet Daniel was drawing very near to God when he was seeking him with confession and humiliation of soul. He did not try to excuse himself or his people, but acknowledged the full extent of their transgression. In their behalf, he confessed sins of which he himself was not guilty and besought the mercy of God, that he might bring his brethren to see their sins and with him to humble their hearts before the Lord. Of course, here we would see Daniel 9. <clears throat> but I am not now speaking of actual mistakes and errors of those who really love God and the truth sometimes commit. There is manifested on the part of men in responsible positions an unwillingness to confess where they have been in the wrong, and their neglect is working disaster 
not only to themselves, but to the churches. Our people everywhere have great need of humbling the heart before God and confessing their sins. But when it is known that their ministers, elders, or other responsible men have taken wrong positions and yet excuse themselves and make no confession, the members of the church too often follow the same course. Thus, many souls are endangered and the presence and power of God are shut away from his people. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have need to make confession. We cannot afford to follow a false path. The Apostle Paul exhorts, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let rather let it rather be healed. Hebrews 12, 12 and 13. What harm has been wrought through neglect to heed this admonition? Suppose that one brother misjudges another. He might have had opportunity to learn whether his suspicions were well-founded. But instead of waiting to do this, he repeats to others his surmisings. <coughs> Thus evil thoughts are stirred in them, and the evil becomes widespread. And all the time the one pronounced guilty is not told of the matter. There is no investigation, no inquiry is made directly of him so that he may have an opportunity either to acknowledge his fault or declare himself of unjust suspicion. A serious wrong has been done him because his brethren had not the moral courage to go directly to him and talk with him freely in the spirit of Christian love. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear you speak about this. I think you should go somewhere else. How often has this occurred? It's occurred in my life. It's occurred most directly. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I have recognized it. It's time to call it for what it is. From all who have thus neglected their duty, confession is due, and none will shrink from it who deem it of any importance for them to seek to answer the prayer of Christ. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, <clears throat> that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. John 17, 20 to 23. How can this prayer be answered by one who has wronged his brother and whose heart is not softened by the grace of Christ so that he will make confession. How can his brethren who know the facts still have unshaken confidence in him while well, he seems to feel no conviction of the spirit of God? He is doing a wrong to the whole church, to all of the church, to all of the members. 
and especially if he occupies a position of responsibility. For he is encouraging others to disregard the word of God, to pass along with sins unconfessed. Many a one will say in heart, if not in words, there is an elder of the church, he does not make confession of his errors, and yet he remains an honored member of the church. If he does not confess, neither will I. If he feels that he is perfectly safe for him not to show any contrition, I too will risk it. What kind of an example is this? Is this a true leader in the spirit of Christ? Is this a true example of what it means to be a disciple? What are we to do, brothers and sisters? How are we to walk? This reasoning is all wrong. Nevertheless, it is common. The church is leavened with the spirit of self-justification, a disposition to confess nothing, to make no signs of humiliation. Who is willing to bear the responsibility of this state of things? Who has turned the lame out of the way? What does this mean for you? What is this saying to you today? How can we greatly accept these words of admonition in our own lives and in our own actions today? My brethren, if you have thus placed a stumbling stone in the path of others, your first duty is to remove it by doing justice to your brother. If we are not willing to show justice, mercy to those that we call brother, are we disciples of Christ? Are we then walking according in the character and path that he would have us to walk? <clears throat> you have thought evil of him. You've said things untrue because you have gathered up heresy. You worked in blindness of mind. And now if you would cure the wound, confess your mistake, and seek to be in complete harmony with your brother. This is the only way to correct your errors. Confess to your brother and bind him close to your heart so that you can labor together in love and in unity. The rules are plainly laid down in God's word. Whether you have been a minister, the president of a conference, the superintendent of a Sabbath school, or a teacher in the Sabbath school, or have held important positions in any branch of the work, there is but one right course for you to pursue. If you have misjudged your brother, if you have had in the least degree weakened his influence, so that the message which God has given him to bear has been made of little or no effect, your sin does not rest merely with the individual, but you have resisted the spirit of God. Your attitude, your words have been against your savior. <clears throat> How do you see this statement? Well, if you disagree with 
somebody, you go straight to them, not to everybody else. Whether it's a pastor or lay person alike. But if something is being said that is untrue against one of our brothers, are we not also treating Christ in exactly the same manner? Yes. Are we then not standing in that court screaming for him to be again crucified? Are we any better than that group? No. That's a hard thing to consider, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Jesus says, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Matthew 25, 40. He identifies his interest with that of every human soul, believer or unbeliever. That God who marks the fall of a sparrow marks your deportment and your feelings. He marks your envy, your prejudice, your attempt to justify your action in the least matter of injustice. <coughs> when we look to cast out someone from fellowship, are we not also casting out Christ? According to this, yes. Is this not in keeping with scripture? Oh, yes. Yep. When you misconceive the words and acts of another, and your own feelings are stirred so that you make incorrect statements, and it is known that you are at variance with your brother, you lead others through your, their confidence in you to regard him just as you do. And the root of bitterness springing up, many are defiled. If we are yeah, looking at a hard statement, it is an hard statement. Who can hear it? Oi. Oi vey. When it is evident that your feelings are incorrect, do you try just as diligently to remove the erroneous impressions as you did to make them? In these matters, the spirit of Christ has been grieved. The Savior accounts these things as done to himself. The Roman guards slapped Christ. And cried, prophesy now. Who did it? Those that would cast out another. That would cast aspersions about their character. <clears throat> that would make comments about, without understanding their very words are treating others, but also treating Christ in the same manner. For me, that is fearsome. Now, God requires that you have, who have thus done the least injustice to another shall confess your fault, not only to the one you have injured, but to those who, through your influence, have been led to regard their brother in a false light, 
and to make of none effect the work God has given him to do. If pride and stubbornness close your lips, your sin will stand against you on the heavenly record. By repentance and confession, you can have pardon registered against your name, or you can resist the conviction of the Spirit of God, and during the rest of your life, work to make it appear that your wrong feelings and unjust conclusions could not be helped. But there stands the action. There stands the evil committed. There stands the ruin of those in whose hearts you planted the root of bitterness. There are the feelings and the words of envy, of evil surmising that grew into jealousy and prejudice. All these testify against you. <clears throat> the Lord declares, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast le left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou have fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. The question is not whether you see as your brother does on controverted points but what spirit has characterized your actions? Have you an experience in close self-examination, in humbling the heart before God? Have you made it a practice of your life to confess your errors to God and to your brethren? All are liable to err. Therefore, the word of God tells us plainly how to correct and heal these mistakes. <clears throat> None can say that he never makes a mistake, that he never sinned at all. But it is important to consider what disposition you make of these wrongs. The Apostle Paul made grievous mistakes, all the time thinking that he was doing God's service. But when the Spirit of the Lord set the matter before him in its true light, he confessed his wrongdoing and afterward acknowledged the great mercy of God in forgiving his transgression. You also may have done wrong, thinking you were perfectly right. But when time reveals your error, then it is your duty to humble the heart and confess your sin. Fall on the rock and be broken. Then Jesus can give you a new heart a new spirit. <clears throat> the words of David <clears throat> are the prayer of the repentant soul. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. <clears throat> Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. <clears throat> Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. And of course, here we would see Psalm 51. <clears throat> Psalm 51. 
Whatever the character of your sin, confess it. If it is against God only, confess only to him. If you have wronged or offended others, confess also to them, and the blessing of the Lord will rest upon you. In this way, you die to self, and Christ is formed within. Thus, you may establish yourself in the confidence of your brethren, and may be a help and a blessing to them. <clears throat> Can the Holy Spirit reside within a temple wherein there is even one idol? I would have to say no. Can Christ be established in a heart in which there is even one sin? When under the temptations of Satan, men fall into error, and their words and deportment are not Christ-like, they may not realize their condition because sin is deceptive and tends to deaden the moral perceptions. But through self-examination, searching of the scriptures, and humble prayer, they will, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, be enabled to see their mistake. If they then confess their sins, <clears throat> and turn from them. The tempter will not appear to them as an angel of light, but as a deceiver, an accuser of those whom God desires to use to his glory. Those who acknowledge reproof and correction as from God are thus enabled to see and correct their errors, are learning precious lessons, even from their mistakes. <clears throat> Their apparent defeat is turned to victory. They stand trusting, <clears throat> not in their own strength, but to the strength of God. Some of the greatest lessons I've had to learn, I've had to learn from my own mistakes. <clears throat> is this not so in the walk with Christ? Is this not so in the walk that is currently before us? Do we not correct and have the ability to correct that which we have done wrong by seeing our errors as they are? They have earnestness, they have zeal and affection, united with humility and regulated by the precepts of God's word. Thus they bring forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. The Lord can teach them his will, <clears throat> and they shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God. They walk not stumblingly, but safely in a path where the light of heaven shines. There must be with all our labors a spirit of meekness, of penitence. God requires that those who minister in word and doctrine shall serve him with all the powers of body and mind. Our consecration to God must be unreserved. Our love ardent, our faith unwavering, then the expressions of the lips will testify to the quickened intelligence of the mind and the deep movings of the Spirit of God upon the soul. Men in the highest positions need to realize that they are as dependent upon God as are the humblest of their brethren. The greater their light and the clearer their knowledge of the truth, the greater is their responsibility. <clears throat> If they are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, they will have a humble estimation of themselves. In the worship of God and in the confession of sin, they will be as the lowliest of his creatures, while at the same time they will take the lead and set the example in everything that is pure and noble. They will be despised by many for their piety 
humility, and conscientiousness. They will be a byword and a hissing to those who, while they profess godliness, are not connected with God. They will be honored, but they will be honored by heaven and by men whose hearts who have not been hardened by rejection of light. Brethren, I see your peril, and again I ask, do you who err make any effort to correct the wrong? Souls may be stumbling along, walking in darkness, because you have not made straight paths for your feet. If you are in positions of trust, I appeal the more earnestly to you, <clears throat> for your own soul's sake, <clears throat> and for the sake of those who look to you as guides, repent before God for every mistake made, and confess your error. If you indulge stubbornness of heart <clears throat> and through pride and self-righteousness do not confess your faults, you will be left subject to Satan's temptations. If when the Lord reveals your errors, you do not repent or make confession, his providence will bring you over the ground again and again. You will be left to make mistakes of a similar character you will continue to lack wisdom and will call sin as righteousness and righteousness as sin. The multitude of deceptions that will prevail in these last days will encircle you and you will change leaders and not know that you have done so. What does this say to you today? Kind of reminds me of uh, Christ entering the most holy place and those that didn't notice it and had Satan step in front of them and didn't recognize it. Is this the position we want to find ourselves today? I ask you who are handling sacred things. I ask the individual members of the church, have you confessed your sins? If not, begin now, for your souls are in great peril. If you die with your mistakes concealed, unconfessed, you die in your sins. <clears throat> The mansions that Jesus has gone to prepare for all who love him will be peopled by those who are free from sin. But sins that are not confessed will never be forgiven. The name of him who thus rejects the grace of God will be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. The time is at hand when every secret thing shall be brought into judgment. And then there will be many confessions made that will astonish the world. <clears throat> the secrets of all hearts will be revealed. The confession of sin will be most public. The sad part of it is that confession then made will be too late to benefit the wrongdoer or to save others from deception. In only testifies that his condemnation is just. He gained nothing by his pride and self-sufficiency and stubbornness, for his own life was embittered. He ruined his own character so that he was not a fit subject of heaven. And by his influence, he led others to ruin. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this is not said of any of us. Yet, <clears throat> we have examples of this all around us.
if we are truly seeking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we need to seek this first through prayer and confession of sins. If we are not willing to do this, then we will not be benefited by the latter rain. Consider that this Sabbath day. If you have a disagreement with the words that are spoken, so be it. Have your disagreement with the prophet. Have your disagreement with the word of God. Choose you this day whom ye will serve is the open invitation that is given to all. Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you, we see how grievously we have wronged you. How grievously we have wronged the character of Christ. For we have done this in the way in which we have treated our brothers and sisters. We have done this by being unwilling to admit to our faults. To admit to our sins. <clears throat> to admit to the words that we have spoken. That have been spoken unjustly. We ask, Father, for your pardon, for forgiveness, that you may prepare us so that we may be able to be sanctified, so that we may be prepared for the outpouring of your spirit, that we may be ready for that which you would have us to do but not in our spirit, but in yours. Direct us now, be with us this Sabbath. Help us that that which we do may more glorify you in spirit and in truth before all with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we ask, for this we praise you, and for this we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.